Hello everybody, welcome back. Now we're into part C of this problem. Now we're gonna use our estimated regression equation for prediction. We're gonna do a couple of things with it. We're gonna do a point estimate, we're gonna do a prediction interval, and we're gonna do a confidence interval. So the problem here, I know it only asks for a prediction interval. That's fine, that's something a little bit new. We haven't done one of those yet. But why don't we just do all of it? and then you'll have a little bit more exposure to these different things. So let's just refresh our memories a little bit. I'm gonna clear away some of this stuff. Let's get rid of all of this. And what we're gonna do here, of course, is just remind ourselves of what we can do with this regression and why is it, of course, that none of this is precise. Don't forget we're working with sample data. So if I have my estimated regression equation that relates quantity with price. Now I know those of you in your economics classes, you always have price on the y-axis, quantity on the x-axis. Yes, this isn't an economics class, this is our statistics class. And here I have quantity as my dependent variable price as my independent variable. So I'm sticking consistent with that. So here I have quantity and I have price. We found a negative relationship, as we would expect, with that intercept at 65.75, and that slope was negative 0.96. Now, remember, this is a point estimate. This is a point estimate of that relationship. It's a point estimate of the intercept. It's a point estimate of the slope. We can use that point estimate to find predicted values of our dependent variable. So if I have, uh, let's see, we want to use, uh, estimate the quantity demanded at a price of 56. Okay, so there's our value of interest. So I can use this and say, okay, here's 56. I can put that into my estimated regression equation. So I'm just inputting 56 into here. And I have 65.75 minus 0.96 times 56. And that's almost exactly 12. So that would be my predicted quantity demanded at a price of 56, right? Or at least that's my point estimate. This is my point estimate of that expected value. So if we set the price at $56, I would expect to sell an average of 12, okay? But that's a point estimate. This is a point estimate based on this as a point estimate. And of course, we understand there's some uncertainty in that point estimate. And we have observed that uncertainty in that point estimate by looking at these standard errors, which is a measure of the uncertainty in those point estimates, by looking at those confidence intervals, which give us a little bit more of an illustration. We can really see the magnitude of that uncertainty. That, okay, my point estimate of the marginal effect is 96, 0.96. I'm 95% confident that that marginal effect is between negative 1.6 and negative 0.3, 0.29, somewhere in there. So if that's the slope, I have some uncertainty about the slope, I have some uncertainty about the intercept, well, maybe, of course, it looks something more like this, right? Maybe but the marginal effect is less or is more so that's less negative right maybe that maybe it's a f more flat relationship maybe it's more steep right depending on where the actual population parameter exists within this interval well certainly that has implications on our ability to use this estimated equation for prediction because if the slope is maybe something closer to this, well then that predicted value is maybe something higher. Or if the slope is something more like this one, 
well, maybe that predicted value should be something less. And so that's how we can visualize the, the, the extent to which we can produce intervals around that predicted value. Now, those would be confidence intervals. And we did an example of that in our previous problem, problem 12-1. We did a confidence interval for that predicted value. We can also do prediction intervals. Because again, keep in mind, those confidence intervals are interval estimates for an average. So if I have, let's draw something like this. Right, here's that point estimate. Then I can have here some lower limit and some upper limit for a confidence interval. A confidence interval is an interval estimate for an average, just like this is a point estimate of an average. Now, what is an average? It's a measure of central tendency. So you know that if you know, reality is somewhere closer to that upper limit, well, that's an upper limit of an average, which means that there exists a distribution of observations around that average. Just like this is a lower limit estimate of an average, well, if that's an estimate of an average, then there exists a distribution of observations around that average. So the next piece of analysis that we do is a prediction interval. And the prediction interval takes into account that distribution and gives us an interval not for an average, but of a specific number or a specific value of our dependent variable. So that interval is always going to be wider. There's a lower limit and there's an upper limit for the prediction interval. And of course, we have an estimate of the distribution of observations around that average. What is our estimate of that unknown population standard deviation, sigma? Our estimate here is that standard error of the regression, which remember that comes from that square root of MSE. So here, let's go through, we'll get a point estimate, we'll do a confidence interval estimate, and we'll do a prediction interval estimate. They're all fairly closely related. The two intervals are very closely related. So let's come back up here. Here, by the way, we could draw on somewhere like this, right? Here's this distribution. If we really wanted to make it a little bit confusing, right? And so there's then our prediction interval. If that made no sense to you, that's fine. It gets a little messy when we start to try to illustrate these things. So let's clean this up. And we'll use this space for our calculations. OK, so our level of interest is 56. So we had y hat was equal to 12 y hat at 56 was equal to 12. Now, for the confidence interval, remember that confidence interval was our point estimate at that level of interest of the independent variable. So that's why I have that little star, y hat star, because this 56, we call that x star, plus or minus that critical value times that standard error of that predicted value. Now, in the previous video, we went through and we talked a bit about this equation for that standard error. This comes from the standard error of the regression multiplied by the square root 1 over n plus the difference between our level of interest in the independent variable and the mean squared, and this piece here, which thankfully we have already calculated. So that standard error of the regression is 1.5. 
times one over our sample size, our sample size was five, plus our level of interest in the independent variable, here we have it as 56, minus our average, so the mean value of x was 57.8, squared. And this next part, what we need that summation of those squared deviations in our, our independent variable, well, we've already calculated that. And if I come up here, remember, there's those squared deviations. And there it is there, 50.8. So let's come back down here and I have 50.8 in that denominator. So now we can calculate this standard deviation for the predicted value. Here I have 56 minus 57.8, oops, 56 minus 57.8 squared divided by 50.8 plus one fifth. Take the square root of that, times it by 1.5, and I have that standard error Point seventy-seven. Okay, so I have now my point estimate. This was 12 plus or minus that critical T. It's the same critical T that's come up in previous videos. We have three degrees of freedom. Alpha is 0.05, so that's 0.025. And there's that three degrees of freedom, 0.025. It's that same critical value that we've used before, 3.182. Times, there's that standard error that we just obtained, 0.77. So this gives me an interval. Let's actually use this diagram here. So I have that point estimate is 12. My upper limit 12 plus 3.182 times 77, whoops, 12 plus 3.182 times 0 0.77, 1445. And that lower limit, 12 minus 3.182 times 0 0.77, 9.55. So there's our confidence interval and our point estimate. Now before we get into interpreting those, let's now get the prediction interval. So the prediction interval, remember all it does is incorporates that distribution of observations around those upper and lower limits of the estimate for the average. So the calculation is actually very similar. All that I need to do is I'm just going to squeeze in here. I just need a 1 plus 1 over n. 1 plus 1 over 5. So all I've done is I'm just adding in that estimate of the, the distribution of observations. The rest of it is entirely the same. So let's go through this calculation again. I think I've lost a line there. 56 minus 57.8 squared divided by 50.8 plus 1 over 5 plus 1 square root times 1.5. This is equal to 1.67. Now I can come up here. I have 12 plus or minus 3.182 times 1.67. And now we can calculate our limits. So I have 12 plus 3.182 times 1.67, so that gives me 17.3. And then my lower limit, 
12 minus 3.182 times 1.67, 6.67. So there I have 6.67. That's it. That's all we can do. So what do we make of all of this? Well, let's remember what we're doing here. I have my estimated quantity is equal to 65.75 minus 0.96 price. That's our estimated regression equation. We can interpret that marginal effect. For each additional dollar that you increase the price, average quantity demanded is expected to fall by 0.96. So you increase the price by $1, average quantity demanded will decrease by 0.96. Okay? We have also, of course, the interval estimate for that slope. I'm 95% confident that for every dollar that you increase the price, average quantity demanded will fall by between 1.6 and 0.29. Then we use it for prediction. <clears throat> and we say, okay, if the price is $56, <clears throat> so if our P star is $56, we predict that we will sell 12 units on average. So that's that point estimate. If the price is 56, we predict that we'll sell an average of 12 units. I'm 95% confident <clears throat> that if the price is $56, we'll sell an average of between 9.5 and 14.5 and units. If the price is $56, I'm 95% confident that we will sell between 17 and 6.7 .7 units. So the difference in what I'm saying is subtle between the confidence interval and the prediction interval. I'll repeat it again. The confidence interval, if the price is $56, I'm 95% confident we'll sell an average of between 9.5 and 14.5 and units. Notice the word average. If the price is $56, I'm 95% confident we will sell between 6.7 and 17.3 units. So when I'm interpreting the prediction interval, I'm not saying anything about an average because that's a prediction interval. That's an interval estimate for an actual number, not an average. The confidence interval is an interval estimate of the average. The prediction interval is an interval estimate of the actual number that I will, in this case, sell. Okay, that's it. We're good. I'm losing my voice. Hopefully that all made some good sense to you. Thank you all very much for watching. We've got one more problem to do in module 14. So let's get into it if you're not already sick of it. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.